All right. Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, happy Friday. Happy AMSSM conference week. I know this is a super busy week for everybody, so I appreciate folks um, uh, hopping on and and spending 30 minutes with us this morning. Um, <clears throat> so today we're again continuing with our our fellow portion of this uh, AMSSM Sports Ultrasound case series. Um, <clears throat> before I introduce our speaker, just one quick note to make um, to remind everybody, all of these, as most of you know, are being recorded um, and are uploaded to the AMSSM YouTube page. Uh, so feel free to hop on over there if you missed any talks or want to rewatch or, or review any of these. You know, the the, the fellow portion of, of this case series has been really exceptional so far, and, and we've been really pleased. Um, so hop on over there if, if you want to take a take a look at any of these prior presentations. So today we are fortunate enough to have uh, Dr. Mavish Moynoud in. She, uh, she hails from the great city of Chicago, Illinois, uh, where she undergrad at Northwestern. She completed a family medicine residency uh, as a badger in Madison, and she is currently completing her tour of the Big Ten at uh, Penn State, uh, where she is a, a sports medicine fellow out there. So today she'll be talking to us about uh, dorsal wrist extensor tendinosis. And with that, I will uh, pass it over to Mavish. I will just share my screen real quick. You guys can see that okay? Yep, looks great. All right, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Cruz. Um, so I am a fellow at State College out in Penn State. Just wanted to say thank you to my ultrasound mentors here. So Dr. Bosha, Dr. Wazinski, and Dr. Wildlinger who have been teaching me ultrasound out here. So super thankful for them as well as the organizers of this lecture series um, that have given me the opportunity to present this morning. So objectives for this presentation this morning are to understand the scanning protocol for the ultrasound evaluation of the dorsal wrist. Um, in that, we'll kind of review some brief anatomy of the dorsal wrist and then also talk about a comprehensive diagnostic report of the dorsal wrist exam. So we'll get started with a short case here. So saw a patient in clinic um, with the chief complaint of a cyst over her right wrist. She's a 45-year-old right-hand dominant female. She works as an ASL interpreter. She notes that she's had swelling on the, on the top of her wrist for about two years now. It says it gets bigger um, when she's working more, it gets smaller when she's not working or she has weeks off. Um, and then acutely when I had seen her, she says, you know, it had gotten better, but then I played ping pong with my kids because we got a new table and then it got worse again. She hasn't tried really using anything as far as a brace because she can't do her job. Um, and then she also notes that the more she works, the she feels like her hands are getting tired. Denies any trauma, pain, erythema, or ecchymosis. And then she says that this has kind of been going on and off for the last two years. And no other significant past medical history. As far as physical exam goes for her, she had some prominent swelling on the dorsum of her right hand and wrist. It appeared well localized, but kind of oblong in shape. It measured about three and a half centimeters by one and a half centimeters. There was no bruising or redness over it. With regard to the palpatory exam, she wasn't tender with any palpation, um, but that area of swelling kind of changed shape with um, palpation. She had decreased wrist extension to approximately 30 degrees, otherwise normal range of motion with flexion, ulnar and radial deviation. Her strength was overall well-preserved um, and she was neurovascularly intact. So just things that I was thinking about and um, things that should be considered. I was mostly thinking about, this is a ganglion cyst versus a tendinopathy tenosynovitis with that swelling. But here are some other things to think about based off of where your exam kind of leads you. Um, but a lot of things on these lists, and I won't go through and read them, but can be kind of seen on ultrasound, which is helpful. So I first went to see if we had any previous imaging. Uh, so these images aren't from her visit, but from actually a few years prior back in 2018. 
just to kind of get a lay of the land, I think it's helpful to take a peek at whatever images you have. So here's a four view back in 2018 that was pretty unremarkable for anything that I would I would think would explain her symptoms that she was having now. So to go over the dorsal wrist ultrasound scanning protocol, this is from the AMS SM website. Things that you should be considering um, for a complete exam are listed on the left hand here. So with regards to the tendons and the muscles, so the six compartments of the dorsal wrist um, takes a look at the nine tendons. Uh, you can do dynamic tendon examination if, if warranted. Um, taking a look at ligaments, so the TFCC as well as the dorsal scaphalunate ligament. With regards to joints, taking a look at the radiocarpal joint, distal radial ulnar joint, and then nerves and vessels. Um, mostly just looking at the superficial radial nerve if it's indicated. There's a lot of other things that you can look at um, depending on the presenting symptoms of your patient. So specifically looking at, at carpal bones, the ulnocarpal joint, um, intersection of the different compartments, um, or even more distally kind of MCP, PIP, and DIP joints if, if needed. So to start off with just some kind of how do you position the patient? What should you what should you ideally have? Um, so usually they'll be seated, they'll have their hand out on a table, the examination table, um, pronated plus or minus a, a towel to help with positioning. With regards to transducer selection, um, using a linear high frequency, if you have a small footprint, um, I don't think I had, well, I did not have one for this, um, this patient, but if you have a small footprint, that's helpful, especially if you're gonna be doing a procedure. So kind of keeping that in, in the back of your mind. Moving on to some just anatomy. We all know the anatomy, but I think it's always helpful to review before we jump into ultrasounding so we know what we're expecting to see. Um, so here on the left is just a picture of the bones and the ligaments. So the positioning of the radius with the carpal bones, the ulna with the carpal bones. And then this gives you an idea of how the tendons lay over the dorsal wrist and the, the six uh, extensor compartments here. Um, one thing that I'll point out is the in yellow here is the superficial radial nerve and um, you can see that with your ultrasound examination. So just something to be aware of. When we take a look at the dorsal wrist with ultrasound, this is the picture I kind of have in the back of my mind, um, the layout of the six compartments here. So more radial on the left side of this photo. Um, and this really well demonstrates the six individual compartments, how they're positioned along the bone um, and how they kind of relate with each other at this point. And this point is at the level of Lister's tubercle, tubercle. And I think that's a good landmark as a reference point. Um, you can palpate it on exam. You can identify it really easily with your ultrasound. Um, and that helps you differentiate kind of where you're starting. And so that's kind of my home base for my ultrasound examinations of the dorsal wrist. So my first go-to is identify that dorsal wrist that I identify the Lister's tubercle that divides the compartments between the second and third. And so I know more radial to that is gonna be my second compartment and more ulnar is gonna be the third compartment. And so that's kind of what you'll see in this picture here, Lister's tubercle um, in the middle, you get a little bit of the distal radial ulnar joint second compartment and then third compartment right there. Um, and this is just a drawing of it. For this, you can see that we're doing a short axis view. So the probe is positioned to get a short axis view of all the tendons there. And so the way I'll present this is kind of normal images and then specific to the case, um, just to help with the learners listening in on this. So the first compartment, when we view it in short axis, um, thinking about specifically here. So from Lister's tubercle, I move over the second compartment and then onto the first compartment, which is more radial. And you'll see two tendons. Um, these pictures are from a high frequency, using a high frequency or maybe even a, a footprint um, transducer, but you're looking for the extensor pollicis brevis as well as the abductor pollicis longus tendons. Um, and then you can also see the superficial radial nerve in this. So this yellow circle here is your superficial radial nerve. And so you wanna see this kind of broomstick appearance um, localized over the, 
that make up the tendon there. And so for our case, we had a different transducer, so not as high quality, but you can still identify the tendons um, of the first compartment right here. This is in short axis. This wasn't related to where her symptoms were. Um, and so those look pretty normal, kind of that broomstick appearance that you expect with a tendon in short axis. And so as we go through these, I'll even include how I would write this in the report. And so for this, I'd say um, the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons of the first compartment were viewed in short axis at the level of Lister's tubercle, and they were normal in appearance. Um, and for this, sometimes it can be helpful to have your patient positioned like this with their um, ulnar side down and radial side up. Not always necessary, it kind of varies, but this is a nice way to um, position them. And that explains kind of like the anisotropy here just because of the positioning. So moving on to the second compartment, so just working our way around. Um, so this is where we're looking with the ultrasound. This will give us a look at extensor carpi radialis um, longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. And once again, we'll see in this picture here, the two tendons kind of sitting over the radius. The Lister tubercle will be just ulnar to it. And so if you ever get lost, kind of refining Lister's tubercle to make sure that you're in the right spot. For this, it's usually easiest to have the patient um, with their hand pronated on the exam table um, and then using a towel if you need it. So with our patient, here's Lister's tubercle. Here's that second compartment. This is radial, this is ulnar, and this is how the patient was positioned here. Um, and so looking at these two tendons, they were viewed in short axis at the level of Lister's tubercle and normal in appearance. So kind of similar to the first compartment um, as well. So moving on to the third, fourth, and fifth, and I do these because you can usually see all of them together um, depending on which transducer you're using. But the third compartment, just anatomically thinking about what's there is your extensor pollicis longus. Your fourth compartment is your extensor indices and then extensor digitorum. And then your fifth is extensor digiti quinti or extensor minimi. Um, and so that's kind of this whole blue box right in here where we'll localize. It can be helpful to kind of just think about what all is in here. So this is your Lister tubercle up here. This is the edge of your second compartment. So you're getting the brevis tendon of extensor carpi radialis brevis. Um, extensor pollicis longus, and then your fourth compartment and your fifth compartment here. Um, this is your ulna, and then this is also your distal radial ulnar joint here. So with regards to our case, um, the similar view, so this is Lister's tubercle, this is more radial, so this is your second compartment, and then to the left is more ulnar, so you can see the third, fourth, and fifth compartments. Um, so here we start to see some abnormalities, when, especially when we look at the third and fourth, you see this kind of hypoechoic hypo region around the tendon. Um, so we wanted to take a closer look at that. And so um, the picture on the right gives us a little better. So that looks like increased fluid content. Sometimes it can be helpful to use your power Doppler to make sure that there's not blood flow in there. Um, you can evaluate for hyperemia. Um, and the way that I would write this on my report is once again, um, you know, saying where you're at. So we're looking at the tendons of the third through fifth compartment. We're looking at them in short axis. We're at the level of Lister's tubercle. And then we just want to describe what we're seeing, not necessarily come to an impression or a plan about this quite yet, but just describe what you're seeing. So you're, we're seeing increased fluid content within the tendon sheath of the third and fourth compartments mostly. Um, and there's that hypoechoic effusion um, surrounding the tendons. Some people will describe this as a halo sign, and I think that's seen a little bit better here with the third compartment um, and then partially with the fourth here. So with that abnormality, we wanted to take a look at this in long axis. I don't always look at long axis um, with dorsal wrist exam unless there's some abnormality in short axis that, um, that I think would warrant further evaluation. And so that's what we did here. So now for this, we just kind of rotate our probe, 
to look at the tenon and long axis, uh, proximals to the left, distal is to the right here. Um, and so we look at the tendons of the fourth compartment, viewed in long axis. You have loss of that fibrillar nature of the tendons that we usually see. Um, so a little tendinopathy that we're seeing here. Um, another thing to, that you could comment on is whether there's pain with palpation or sonopalpation. Um, she did not have any pain with sonopalpation, but I think that's something else to consider as part of your ultrasound exam. And I know other speakers have commented on that as well. And so we kind of move on from there. Um, we looked at third, fourth, and fifth during the previous one. And so now we're going to go on and just evaluate the sixth compartment um, and we can take a look at TFCC as well. So the sixth compartment here is just the tenon of extensor carpi ulnaris. This is a picture of it in short axis, um, kind of sitting along the ulna. This is, um, you could also test for subluxation for, of this tendon, especially if they're symptomatic on the side of this patient was not having symptoms here. Um, you can still test and say that there was no subluxation. You can also view it in long axis here. But with regards to the ultrasound report that I would put out for this, let's say the ECU tendon of the sixth compartment was viewed in short and long axis. Um, it was normal in appearance. This is not, the picture on the right is not from our patient, it's from a different patient, that's why it looks different. Um, but normal in appearance with dynamic testing, there was no evidence of subluxation. Um, and so that is that. Um, and then the last couple of things to look at, the dorsal scaphoid ligament. This is the scaphoid here, this is the lunate. You're looking at this part of the image um, if you're looking at it on ultrasound and specifically just to give us a point of reference, the x-ray images um, tell us exactly where we're looking for. So the ligament here connects these two bones, the scapholuneate um, ligament. To stress it, you can have the patient ulnar do some ulnar deviation or you can do it for them. Um, and what you could see if this is injured or um, you may see increased laxity if they, when they ulnar deviate. So that's kind of how you stress them. So with regards to a sample, sample ultrasound report, um, this is kind of the basics that you should have in any sort of radiology report, um, referring provider, where the exam was done, what the indication for it was, um, study type, whether it was limited or complete. So for this, it would be a complete location of it, laterality, this is the patient's right hand. Did you have any images to compare it to, whether it's a previous ultrasound or MRI or x-ray? So we looked at her previous x-ray. Um, and then just equipment. So we have a Philips um, machine and this was the transducer that we used here. And so what I've done here, instead of kind of reading all this out, this is kind of what I had read along the way of the findings, the first and second compartments were normal. That abnormal finding in the third and fourth compartment with increased fluid content. Um, and it's really important here not to come to your assessment of it yet, but just to describe what you see. Um, and I know that can be a little bit hard, but I think that's something to continue working on. Um, taking note that you looked at the distal radial joint or the scapholuneate ligament. Um, and then also the sixth compartment and noticing that that looked normal in short axis and long axis. And then with dynamic testing, there was no subluxation. Um, so those are kind of the big summaries. I do this usually in order of how I do my exam. Um, everyone has a different template. Some people, if they're not doing a complete exam, will kind of just list what they looked at, which is appropriate too. But if you're doing a complete exam, you should really hit on all the points. For me, I, I just do it in the order of what I do my exam in, and that's pretty consistent each time I do the exam. So I think that's helpful. You can create a template for it and then just make the changes that you need to. So as far as the impression, this is kind of where you take the information that you got out of your ultrasound findings and come to a diagnosis or an impression about it. So for this patient, um, we called it a third and fourth dorsal compartment extensor tenosynovitis with tendinopathy or tendinosis. Um, and then kind of additional comments about it. So extensor compartment tenosynovitis, 
It can be seen in individuals due to overuse, as in this case is given her history of being an ASL interpreter. So she's using her hands constantly. Um, other things to kind of consider uh, if you didn't have that story or that HPI would be um, other disease processes that can make you more inclined to having an extensor tenosynovitis. So rheumatoid arthritis, gout, um, CPPD, as well as atypical infection. So kind of just thinking about that as well. So if this was a a different patient who had a completely different story, doesn't really use her hand or her wrist at all, um, and had this, kind of thinking twice about, is this something more, is this more of an atypical infection? Are there risk factors for that? As opposed to um, just overuse if they aren't really, that doesn't line up with their story. So here are some references and some photos um, where I took them from. And that's about it. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can email them to me. You can um, find me on Twitter and send me a message there as well. All right. Great job, Mavish. That was that was really well done. You know, that's exactly what we were looking for. I think you did a really great job um, uh, formulating a very comprehensive dorsal wrist exam, um, which obviously will you know will help uh, check all the boxes for a for a complete. Um, examination, which, which like, you know, you've heard, we're trying to harp on, you know, making sure we have a full complete examination when we do these scans. So, so really great job um, with that. I'll just make one or two quick points here. And then I'm sure uh, some other folks might have some points or, or, uh, or some questions for you. You know, you mentioned using Doppler when you're looking um, at these, you know, abnormal tendons. Um, you know, I see this not uncommonly um, where folks will have, you know, this, this uh, tenus synovitis of the fourth dorsal compartment and, you know, really turning Doppler on to make sure that it's not just a, you know, a simple sheath effusion. And there truly is, you know, tenosynovial inflammation, I think helps, um, helps with your diagnosis. Um, the other point to make, uh, when I'm looking at the fourth dorsal compartment, I'll always add in the posterior interosseous nerve. So it kind of sits at the floor of the fourth dorsal compartment. Um, I think that's, that's just helpful to take note of that, especially if, if you plan on doing any interventions in this area, you know, knowing where that's at so you, you don't plunk a needle right, um, right through that nerve, which would not be ideal. Um, <laughs> so yes, I will, I will add that in. And then the only other uh, point that I have to make, you know, you were talking about dynamic imaging and stress testing of the scapal lunate joint and, and you know, doing radio ulnar deviation. The other thing you could consider is you know, having the patient do a clenched fist view um, can help see splaying of that joint. But at least in my hands, what I've seen um, is that radial ulnar deviation places a bit more stress across that ligament. And I am more um, likely to see, you know, subtle laxity or whatnot with, with that stress view versus the clenched fist. But um, yeah, just a couple points to make. Looks like Doug's unmuted. Doug, you gonna make some points? Yeah, that was a really nice job. Um, I do have a couple points. Um, one's an anatomic point. So the the figure that you had of all the dorsal compartments was a little misleading in that the retinaculum, the extensor retinaculum does have a um, attachment to the bone all the way throughout like shown, except for the sixth compartment. And on the sixth compartment, the retinaculum does not attach onto the ulna. It actually has its major attachment onto the <clears throat> pisiform with minor attachments on the triquetrium and TFCC and capsule. And that's important because therefore the retinaculum is not involved with stability of the ECU tendon. What's involved with this st stability is the subsheath of the ECU. And when you pronate and supinate <clears throat> and look at the ECU, you'll see this little echogenic line around the ECU, which is a subsheath, which is, should be focused on when evaluating for instability. So that's just, uh, just one point. Just a couple other comments. Um, so on the protocol, when I do a wrist exam, and it doesn't matter whether I'm doing a dorsal exam or let's say I get a referral for carpal tunnel syndrome, I always start with the joint. Um, and I also, I always start with the dorsal joint. So you're long axis view <clears throat> that you have of the fourth compartment is my first image. And what you see there is the, the radius, you see the lunate and you see the capitate. And the reason why I have that is you see the dorsal synovial recesses. And obviously when we're scanning, you know, we're looking the full width of the 
wrist joints, um, but will capture an image. That's my first view. And the second view is that same image with Doppler. Um, because it gives a, a peek into the joint is a peek in this is, is an important clue. And in this case, it would be a very important clue because if I saw some synovial hypertrophy and hypervascularity of the dorsal synovial recesses, then I start to think about inflammatory arthropathy. If I see a small effusion and I'm not seeing uh, any signs of uh, synovitis of the dorsal recesses, now I'm starting to think intraarticular. Um, and, and that's just true really for all my protocols. I, I can only think of one or two where I don't start with a joint, maybe proximal hamstrings and plantar fascia. But if I'm doing a medial ankle exam or a lateral ankle exam, my first images are of the joint um, because I think that's an important uh, uh, clue into what's going on. Um, I also learned just this, uh, you know, emphasizing what Ryan just said. Um, when I was first learning ultrasound, and watching the masters do it, it seems like they have they have one finger on the Doppler, and they're always clicking Doppler and such. And so I agree. In this case, um, a, you know, a long and short axis uh, with Doppler imaging is an important clue. My suspicion is is it would show some hypervascularity, but not uh, as the typical hypervascularity. We might start to think about it in inflammatory arthropathy. And I've seen rheumatoid arthritis in this age group present as a fourth compartment, uh, true tenosynovitis. Um, so I guess I would just add that in my protocols, I always add uh, joints first. And I think the scaphalunate ligament is always part of my protocol, even if I'm doing, let's say a carpal tunnel. And the reason why, if you're 60 years old and you have carpal tunnel syndrome, um, you know, if you have attenuation of the dorsal scaphalunate ligament, that's probably signs of early osteoarthrosis in a slack pattern. Um, and osteoarthrosis is, is a predisposing factor to carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, and how they might do if you, if you uh, proceed with a release. Um, so again, it just gives me a clue. And then the, the, the last image that I get with every wrist is the DRUJ dorsally, as you talked about. There's a number of, well, there's a subgroup of people who uh, develop DRUJ synovitis as their first presentation of an inflammatory arthropathy as well. Um, so that's just, you know, so every wrist exam, I have these five images or four images that everybody gets no matter where I'm doing, uh, where I'm focused on, whether it's a volar or a dorsal wrist exam. Um, and then the, probably the last thing I would have done is, is done a, if, if you had a small footprint transducer I would have looked at the retinaculum while dorsiflexing the wrists because you can get uh, retinacular impingement of the fourth compartment that could be contributing to this. So good case, a lot of good discussion. I did a nice presentation uh, going through it carefully and as well as the report. Thank you, Dr. Cruz and Dr. Hoffman for those points. I think that's really helpful for someone that's still learning. So I appreciate it. We're, we're all still learning. <laughs> I had a case very early on in my career where um, of course, it had to be a doctor's daughter, and uh, she had x-rays from a year and a half ago, and they were normal, and she had dorsal wrist pain. She was a Nordic skier, and all I saw was a little bit of synovitis, very low grade, and I thought, well, you know, she's doing 50 push-ups a day and et cetera. It was a little bit of overuse, and uh, we ended up injecting her, and she got better, but then came back, you know, three months later, and and uh, was having pain again. And at that point, what I decided was to uh, repeat x-rays because they were a couple years old and she had complete collapse of her scaphoid. Um, and I'm sure she had collapse of her scaphoid prior at, at the time of my ultrasound examination. And that was a good lesson for me that again, what, what my initial uh, images showed was there was a joint problem. And if you have a joint problem, then she needed updated x-rays um, in this situation. And interesting enough, uh, spontaneously, the other side collapsed as well um, a few years later. Um, so she had some predis predisposition with her, uh, you know, arterial anatomy that uh, caused this. But the point, the lesson for me was, you know, it, if you think in joint, then make sure you have updated x-rays. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Those are great points, as always. Um, all right, so 
great job, Mavish. Um, like I said, I, I thought that was a, a really well done um, presentation. So thanks for thanks for giving that. Um, just a quick note here: we're off next week, as always, and we'll return uh, two weeks. So it'll be April thirtieth. Dr. Stephen Arnold is going to talk about some iliopsoas um, pathology, and again, that's on uh, April thirtieth. Otherwise. Everybody have a good Friday. Enjoy the rest of, uh, of the uh, conference week and weekend, and we'll see you guys in a couple weeks.